Good morning. Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> Mark chapter 5. Going to be in the first 20 verses there. And I know you're not used to this. So I'm going to read out of the King James Version. I tried to read out of that other version, and this is my what I call my preaching Bible, and I'm just so used to it, I just can't change. When you get my age, it's hard to change, but I'm telling you, it's time for change. And I've tried... As a matter of fact, you know, I'm, I, I've talked about retiring and someday it's coming and I've tried to encourage it as best I could. I started packing up some of my books in my office and this week I got ready to preach, get my stuff ready to do this sermon this morning. I thought, well, I'm going to try to preach out of a different version of the Bible and I, I packed up all those other versions of the Bible. So I already got packed up and taped up and, and so I wasn't going to dig them out. So I'm going to use the King James this morning. Mark chapter 5, Jesus had done some things in, in his life and his ministry and some of the things he'd done just recently prior to this passage of Scripture was he'd cleansed the leper, he'd healed the man that his friends let him down through the roof as Pastor Anthony preached about a couple of weeks ago. He had raised a widow's son. He had calmed the angry seas when, when his disciples, they were crossing the Sea of Galilee, and his disciples got worried and said, aren't you afraid we're going to perish? And Jesus got up and just spoke, and the, and the water's calm. And then this right here takes place. Mark chapter 5, starting verse one, number 1, says, And they came over onto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately. When? It was immediately. There met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not even with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains. And the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken by pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adore thee, thy God, that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was nigh under the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what was done. They came to Jesus. Did you get that? And they came to Jesus. And they saw him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was come into the ship that he had been possessed with the devil, prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee 
and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, ask your blessings upon the reading of your word. Lord, I pray this morning that I would decrease so that you might increase. I pray that the people that you have gathered here today won't see me, won't hear me, but they'll just hear you. The words that you have to say to them today. Because Lord, I know that all of us aren't going through the same experiences in our life at this time. Some are going through good times, some are going through bad times, and Lord, some are going through terrible times. And all of us need to hear a different word. And Lord, I pray they would hear it from you. But Lord, I do pray that they would respond to you in the way that only you can respond as this man that had the unclean spirits in him and Lord was possessed. Lord, when he saw you, he ran to you. I pray that these people would run to you today. Lord, and, and, and as they came, they just stood there and were amazed at what you had done. I, I pray that we would sit here amazed at what you can do for us. And Lord, as you instructed this man at the end of his time with you, Lord, you instructed him to go and to tell others, I pray that today when we leave here, we would understand that it is time for us to go and to tell others. It's time for change. And I pray that we would be used in the change. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You see, what you find here is Jesus had calmed the sea. He would made it across the Sea of Galilee. He had The storm had raged and caused a mighty disturbance, and he just spoke it out and said, Be still, and everything calmed down. So I'm going to tell you that it looks to me like the disciples would have gotten the message. I mean, wouldn't you? You're on the boat. The boat is rocking to and fro, and... I really didn't want to read this passage because I'm, 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 I'm fixing to leave next week and go on a cruise and, you know, I, you know, the boat's kind of rocking. And the disciples get down to Jesus and say, hey, shouldn't you wake up? Aren't you scared to death? Aren't you worried that we're going to perish? And you realize as you look down that passage of Scripture back in Mark 4 that Jesus was not worried. He said, where's your faith? Let me ask you that this morning. Where's our faith at today? Oh, we look around and, man, I'm going to tell you, if you don't know, and I, I, I'm going to just buzz right through this, we live in some tough times today. Can I just say it like this? People around us are crazy. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you realize that or not, but there's just some people that are crazy. I've had an interesting last couple of weeks. I've got a dear friend of mine, and he's got a brother that is has got some mental problems as a, a schizophrenic, and <clears throat> we've had him under medications for years. He's, he's battled this for about 50 years. He's 68 years old now. And uh, he had a fall at the home that he's in now, and they take, took him to the hospital. And once he got there, he decided that he enjoyed it there because he didn't have to do anything. Any of you ever get that way? <laughs> I don't have to do any of that therapy. don't have to do any of them exercises. I'm just going to lay in this bed. And we instructed him, my friend Chris, his brother said, you've got to get him up and moving or he will be content and stay there. And they said, no, you don't understand. He's in the hospital. He's not going to stay here. We understand. So they moved him to a rehab unit. And guess what they did? They believed every word that he said, and he decided he was going to lay there. His favorite thing to do was to wake up in the morning, pull the covers up to his chin, and not be bothered. He, as a matter of fact, asked the nurses when they come into his room, will you feed me? The nurse said, does your mouth open? Let me see. And he opened it. She says, does your arm raise? And he said, he raised his hand. She said, can you take this out of my hand? He took it out of her, his, her, out of her hand. And she said, now you can feed yourself. <laughs> and so they got him, encouraged him, and got him up and got him moving. And finally we had to... Go last week, last Wednesday, I went up with Chris and we moved him from the rehab unit back to the group home. And you don't, you don't think about this stuff, but because of his schizophrenia, we were worried about what might take place. Chris asked me to go instead of his wife going with him. And, and I've been in this situation with Brother Mike many times 
As a matter of fact, one time many years ago, before I even was really in the ministry, I was an in, interim pastor at my home church. I walked into the office that morning and <clears throat> just had set my stuff down on my desk and I heard something. I looked at my office door and the secretary of the church said, well, he's right there. And I knew that was a problem. <laughs> And about that time, two officers walked into my office and began to talk to me about Brother Mike and said, do you know him? I said, yes. And they said, we need you to come. He's asking for you. I said, me? Yes, you. Why are you all there? Well, because he's called. And you've got to realize this was 30 years ago. This was 30 years ago. He'd called 911 and said that an angel had instructed him to drop a bomb on Knoxville and he needed to talk to Billy Graham before he did that. Could they please help before he dropped this bomb? Now in that day and time, if you said something like that, they thought you were serious. So they asked me to go to his house. And I was young and immature and thought I had all the answers and I said, sure, I'll go. And they said, you get in our car. And I said, no, I'll just follow you there. And I got in the car and I followed them there and we got to his subdivision where him and his mom lived and they stopped their car and I thought, well, you crazy things. He lives about four houses on down. So I drove around them and pulled up to the front of their house and when I did, I realized there was a policeman behind that house over there and there was a policeman behind this house over here and there was a policeman behind that house over there and I thought, do I crawl into the house or do I just walk in? So I finally, after a, 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 a sincere time of prayer. I walked on in. And he was so worked up by that time that he believed in his mind that he was Michael the archangel and that he was, had a mission. And that was to take care of this and all he was to do was to contact Billy Graham before doing it. <clears throat> and, and he was, listen to me, he was standing in his kitchen talking to me and he was talking in Hebrew which a language he does not know. Now, I'm going to tell you, not only was I scared, everybody else in the room was scared. We were all concerned at what might take place. So after a while, I thought, well, let's solve this problem. I took the man that was in charge, took him out of that room, went, walked into the living room. I said, here's the deal. Why don't one of you guys talk like Billy Graham and just let him call him? He said, sir, we cannot do that. Because what if he really does have a bomb? I thought, well, that's a good answer. Let's get him out of here. <laughs> well, it was a big, long ordeal. We finally did, got him into the hospital and all. And He's done this more than one occasion. <clears throat> I'm telling you all this to tell you that when someone is possessed, as this man is, you cannot control him. I've seen him when the officers were there and they shot him with a stun gun and he just reached up and pulled them little things off and throwed them down. And they shot him again and he pulled those out and threw them on the ground. And the whole time I was backing up as far as I could back up. And, and it took seven, six or seven officers to get him on the ground. And he's a smaller man than I am. I've seen this take place so that when I read this passage of Scripture that this man is possessed and he comes running to Jesus, do you understand what I'm thinking? See, because I've seen that man run at me before. And I can't imagine what the disciples felt. It doesn't say what they did, but I can tell you what they probably did. They got back on the boat. <laughs> If they had any brain at all, they were climbing back on that boat. I would have been. I'd have been running to the boat, but Jesus just stood there. See, this miserable soul was coming to Jesus, and as he made his way there, it was not just him. It was something possessing him. And, and, and every time I read this passage of Scripture or preach about this passage of Scripture, somebody always calls me that afternoon and says, Do you really believe? <clears throat> so let me save you the phone call. Do you really believe that people can be demon-possessed? Yes. What planet are you from? I believe that Satan is real. 
I don't believe he's made up. I don't believe he's a little red character with horns and a, and a pitchfork and a pointed tail. I believe he's real. And I believe he is more rampant today than he ever has been before in my ministry. And I've been in the ministry for 30 years. And I believe he's real. And I believe that he was possessing this man. And as he possessed this man, this man saw Jesus and saw an opportunity for change. And he ran to him. And he got the words out. Jesus, will you help me? Will you help me? And then if you read this passage of Scripture, in whatever translation that you use, if you read it, you'll find out that, that the man spoke those words and after that, the demon took over. Because Jesus asked, said, well, what is your name? And he said, well, Legion. Because we're many. Now in that day and time, that meant over 2,000. Can you imagine being possessed by more than one person? Can you imagine in your mind having to deal with more than one? I know a lot of you, and some of you can't deal with the one that you got, okay, let alone with more than one. And this guy had thousands that he was dealing with. We got Brother Mike, <coughs> Chris's brother in the car, and was making our way to the home, and <coughs> I was sitting in the front in the passenger seat, and Mike was sitting behind me. And the whole time he's behind me, he's talking to somebody else. I don't know if that bothers you, but that's creepy to me. And it made it even worse because he was talking about me. <laughs> and I knew he was talking about me because he don't like me. He's very vocal in his thoughts, and he lets me know that, and that's okay. Because we were taking him back home to a place he didn't want to go to. And he told me, he said, <coughs> Gary, he said, will you take me to get something to eat? Chris wasn't in the car yet. I said, absolutely. Where do you want to go? Long John Silvers. I said, well, that might be a problem. <laughs> he said, oh, no, it's, a, it's in with the Taco Bell. I thought, he really is crazy. Can you imagine a Long John Silvers and a Taco Bell in the same building? It does exist. It's in Jefferson City. There is one. So I said, okay, we'll go. What, what do you want to eat? Listen to this. This guy's 68 years old, smaller than I am, much smaller than I am. And he said, all I want... All I want is 30 pieces of shrimp, two pieces of fish, and two pieces of chicken, and a large Dr. Pepper. I said, Mike, how long are you going to eat on that? He said, right now. We went straight to Long John Silver's. We ordered when Chris placed the order into the little the machine there, whatever you call that thing, and, and the lady on the other side said, my goodness, are you hungry? Anything to just keep him calm till we could get there. See, Jesus dealt with this man, and when he dealt with this man, he didn't just deal with this man, but he dealt with the problem. See, a lot of times we want out of the situation we're in, but we don't want to deal with the problem. We want the surroundings around us to change, but when reality is not the area that we live in, it's not the things that are around us, but it's the thing inside that needs to change. See, most of the time the problem is not those things that are around us, but it's a heart issue. And Jesus realized that, and he listened. You know, the thing that gets me, Jesus listened to the demons. They said, don't put us away. Let us go into the swine. Now, you've got to realize that the swine, that, <clears throat> for the Jews, that was an unclean animal. They should not have been around. So we must have been occupied by some Gentiles, and Jesus said, well, I'll tell you what, okay, you can go. And he let them go out and go into that situation. See, this man was dead spiritually as some of us are in our lives during the week. We come to church, man, we'll sing these songs that I'm not going to be anything other than a conqueror with Jesus Christ. And then on Monday we're whipped to the head because somebody said something they shouldn't have to us. I was at the gas station. Y'all know, they've been around here a long time. You know, the gas station is my favorite place to witness. Because once that person pulls up on the other side of the pump and put that nozzle in, they're trapped. Now, they can get back in their car, and if they do, that's okay. And so I was talking to this man the other day at the gas station. I said, <coughs> I got to tell you something. I said, man, I'll tell you, I'm just having the best day ever. What about you? He said, no, it's terrible. I said, is it really that bad? He said, it's absolutely worse than you can imagine. I said, well, tell me about it. He said, no, you don't want to hear my problems. I said, you're right. I don't really, I don't really 
but I know somebody who does. And better than that, do I know somebody that does, I know somebody that can fix it. I know somebody that cares. I know somebody that cares enough about this one man that he was willing to stop and he was willing to take the time from this man that lived in the graveyard. Anybody want to do that? Lived in the tombs. Now, in those days, there weren't monuments and flowers all around. It was just a hole in a rock and it was a destitute place. But Jesus stopped, made his way for this man. And as he got there, he said, no man could bind him. But Jesus has got him stopped talking. See, when you encounter Jesus, things will change. But you've got to be willing to get to that point to change it. Not only is there a miserable soul there, but there's a mighty Savior. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe Jesus can do all things. I believe he's got more power than you can ever imagine. And he just spoke to this demon-possessed man and the demons came out of him, entered into these pigs or swine, the scripture calls them, and the swine took off. I've been to this place over in, in, in the Middle East. I've been to this place. And, and the swine or the pigs ran off down the steep blank and then jumped into the river. Now, the pigs don't do that. They like mud, but they ain't going to jump in the water. And they all jumped in there and drowned. Now, the scripture doesn't say if the demons drowned, but the swine did. See, this Savior spoke it and it happened. You think you got a problem too big for him? He took care of over 2,000 demons in one time, in one encounter, and just speaking it into existence. And as he spoke it into existence, you've got to realize that he has the power over it all. The, the, the disciples and the people that had been following him saw that he had the power to heal people. They saw that he had the power to raise people from the dead. And now they're seeing him speak into this man's life and change his life drastically. That's a, that's a mighty Savior that we serve. He has the power to defeat anything that you're going through. He has the power to defeat anything that ever is ever was and ever going to be. You think it's going to get better living around here? Ha, huh, it's not going to get better. It's only going to get better in your little circle if you and the Lord get together. Anthony touched on it last week and about the revivals that are taking place and he sent me a text or sent the staff a text this morning. He said just an update on what's going on in Washington, D.C. They had over 20 salvations last night and had several surrender to full-time Christian ministry. And he's preaching again today. <clears throat> and he told me, he said, now listen, the one thing that I'm worried about that I'm going to be gone is that revival will take place at New Providence Baptist Church while I'm gone, and I'll be in Washington, D.C. And I said, Pastor Anthony, don't worry about that. I'll be preaching. There will be no revival here. See, there was a miserable soul that was there and there was a mighty Savior. Let me ask you this. Have you encountered that mighty Savior recently? Have you took the time to stop what you're doing and see what he has to say to you? See, this man spoke to Jesus and he said, what do I have to do with thee? Jesus, thou son of the most high God, I am poor that you, by God, that torment me not. See, there was this mighty Savior there. There was a miserable soul there. But not only that, there was a marvelous, marvelous salvation. See, Jesus allowed the demons to pass and clear out of this man. And this man that had been unclothed, had been living in the graveyard, had been running to and fro, that was breaking the chains, that could not be bound, that could not be tied down. This man is now talking to Jesus, and now he's asking Jesus, can I go with you? What do you think the disciples were saying now? I'm not even sure some of them, if they were with me, were off of the boat yet, okay? <laughs> but the ones that were there are saying, Jesus, hey, you took care of this dude. That's all right. That's great and all well. But he don't need, he don't need to go with us. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what we do? I'm glad your life's changed. I'm glad that something's different, but you don't need to follow with me. 
I never forget the testimony of a, a man named Dwayne Blue, Dwayne and Iris Blue, out of Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, Iris Blue, her life story goes like this: She was a, the owner of two uh, gentlemen's clubs, and some old preacher came to their gentlemen's club every evening and preached in the parking lot. And every evening she'd go out there and run him off. And every evening, the same encounter. Iris, I'm just here to share the gospel. I'm here to help people t change their life, get a better life. And one night she listened and God changed her life. And she surrendered to the Lord in the parking lot of her own gentleman's club, got up the next morning and sold it all. Started following Jesus. In the process of following Jesus, <coughs> On every year at Thanksgiving, she would invite somebody to her family Thanksgiving dinner. Now, wouldn't you like to have her as your daughter? You coming to Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah, and I'm bringing somebody with me. Oh, no. Because it was always somebody that was in trouble. It was always somebody that had a rough past. And this year, she had talked to her brother, and her brother talked to her about a man that he worked with in construction. And, and she, he, he told her, he said, listen, this old boy rides a, 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 a one of them three-wheel motorcycles that was homemade. And on the fenders of the two back wheels, he has two a German shepherd on each wheel. And they ride everywhere that he goes. They're not chained down. They don't have a collar, none of that stuff. And he will call them on command. And she said, I want to meet him. And so she met him. And she invited him to Thanksgiving dinner. Now, wouldn't you like to be the mama that day? Here comes this old boy with long flowing hair, big old long beard. He's got on a tank top, tennis shoe, I mean boots, and blue jeans, and he's riding this big old motorcycle with these two big old German shepherds on the wheels. And he pulls into your driveway. And he comes inside and enjoys Thanksgiving dinner with the family. Two weeks later, she was been talking back and forth with him, and she told him on the telephone, she said, listen, you know my life, you know my family's life. I've got to tell you about this man called Jesus. And he said, I know. She said, well, let me explain it to you. And he said, I've already read it. He said, I read it this morning. In that paper you left on my motorcycle. I know what it says in Romans. I've already asked Jesus to come live in my heart. I prayed that prayer. What do I need to do next? She said, you need to get baptized. He said, okay, I'll do it. They lived two states away from each other. He had to hunt down a church. On Tuesday morning, he goes into a little old Baptist church, knocks on the door, and the preacher comes to the door, the only one in the church, and he said, can I help you? He said, yep. He said, I got saved last night. I'm here to follow you wherever you go. He said, and I'm here to get baptized. Now, you can't imagine what a preacher would think at that point. And he did. He took him to the, the hospital to do visitation. He took him to a meeting he had to go to. He explained who he was everywhere he went. And this old boy got saved. And when he got saved, I'm not talking about he got saved. I mean he got saved. He had a marvelous salvation. His life totally changed. If you ever get a chance, you can look up their testimony. It's still online. Dwayne and Iris Blue, he said the most saddest part of his life after he came to know Jesus was that he got sick. <clears throat> he said when he got sick, he said nobody came to visit him. Because, you know, I don't know if y'all realize this, but sometimes church people don't like people that don't look like them and don't act like them and don't talk like them. And so when he got sick, nobody came to visit him. He said after 10 days, I believe it was, after 10 days, the fellas that he used to ride motorcycles with down at the bar, they came and brought him food. Not the church, but his former friends. He said the first day, I thought that was the saddest thing in my life. And he said the second day, I thought this is the greatest day of my life. He said, because when he came in there and brought me food, I locked the door. He said, and then I just opened up the Bible and started preaching to him. He said, I didn't even know how to preach. But he started preaching. 
many were saved because of this one man's life, because of this one lady's life, because of this preacher's life. No, it because of one marvelous salvation. See, it's not about the preacher. It's not about me. It's not about Pastor Anthony. It's about Jesus. It's about this guy that saw Jesus, and when he saw him, he realized who he was. And when he was saved, and when he was changed, and when his life was totally, radically changed, let me tell you what he wanted to do. He wanted to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, no. Jesus said, go home and testify. Go home and tell them what has happened. Jesus is telling that to us today. It's time for you to go home and testify. It's time for you to go home and share with others. It's time for you to go back to your workplace and share, with Je- share about Jesus. It's time for you to go anywhere and share about Jesus. I'm telling you, we're living in a time that needs to hear Jesus more than ever before, and they're willing to hear to get the change, but we're just not telling them. Have you told anybody this week? Have you shared the gospel one single time this week? It's one. Of my, it's my favorite time. I'm telling you, it really is. I love. You know, this is going to sound crazy, and it is. I love to run low on gas because I know I can get to the gas station, and I know I'm going to find somebody. There. I go to the busiest station in town. I don't care how much the gas costs. I'm not about that. You say, well, you ought to be. No, listen to me. I'm about getting the gospel message out. It's not my responsibility how they respond. It's my responsibility to tell them. And I can tell them at the gas station. They're there. <clears throat> they, got that, they got that pump in. I had one one day, it's about a month ago. Bless her heart. I started talking to her about Jesus. I started, started talking to her about the scripture. I never seen anybody tear a pump out of their car so fast in all my life. She got that pump out of that car, got it back into the, the machine, and she drove off, and I walked around the pump. See, she bought $3.75 worth of gas. Well, you and I know she wasn't going far. <laughs> so I got the pump, done pumping my gas. I got my car started driving real slow past the other gas stations. <laughs> I was going to see if I could find her. Because now I'm on a mission. Are you on a mission? See, this guy, his, his life was changed. You know, I've been 30 years in the ministry. And I can say this with confidence. A lot of times the reason we don't share is because we hadn't changed. I had a lady at my church one time. She begged me to go talk to her husband. <clears throat> they were having marital problems. and She said, I just need you to go. I said, okay, I'll go. I went to his house the next week, t- took a fellow with me, and we knocked on the door, and he invited us in. After we got in there and we talked a while, I said, well, David, I'm here to share with you some news about a man called Jesus. He said, okay. So I, I, I shared the gospel with him and went all through it, got read the scripture to him. I said, is there anything that would prevent you from praying this prayer right now and asking Jesus to come live in your heart? He said, not a thing right now. I had the fellow that was with me to pray the sinner's prayer, lead him in the sinner's prayer. He, we prayed the prayer, and he got up. Man, he was crying his eyes out. We was all crying, and, and we got done. And I said, now, David, listen, there's more to it than this. You've got to come to church. Now, you've got to grow up in the Spirit. You've got to grow up in Christ. He said, I'll be there Sunday morning. He came. We baptized him. Two weeks later, his wife came in my office. I thought, man, she's going to be so excited. I bet you I'm her favorite preacher now. She sat down across from me in my desk and she told me how much she hated me. She told me how much I had done some things wrong because she didn't want him to really get saved. She just wanted him out of her house. I said, well, honey, I'm here to tell you that's not what you asked me. And I'm here to tell you that when me and 
I won't tell you who I went with me, but when we walked in that door, we knew right away what was going to happen. This man needed Jesus. We was fixing to present Jesus to him, and he was fixing to accept. And his life has changed. She left the church, left her husband. See, a lot of times we say what we want, but we don't really want it. But this man, when he met Jesus, he changed. We need to present the gospel so that people will change. It's not just the job of the pastor. It's not just the job of your teacher. It's just not the job of your friend, but it's your responsibility. Will you go this week and share the gospel with somebody? Will you make a change? Everybody's talking about we want revival. Why don't that come to us? Well, the reason it doesn't come to us is because you just go to your spot anywhere you want to and draw a circle on the ground. And you step in that circle. And when that person inside that circle gets to Jesus, there'll be revival. And then once there's revival in that circle, it can come out of that circle and go to another circle. But it's got to start in that circle. It's got to start individually. And when we talk about revival, we need to understand what revival is. Revival is understanding that you're under the control of Jesus Christ, that you've been saved by Him, and you are willing to listen to Him and follow Him. See, this man, this demon-possessed man, when Jesus said, no, you can't go with me, you've got to go home, that man went home. He obeyed Jesus. We have to be in obedience to Him, not to what we think, not to what, what we want to do, but we've got to be obedient to Him. Are you obedient to Christ today? Are you willing to do whatever He says? If he says on your way home, go stop by Joe Blow's house and share the gospel with him, are you willing to do it? Some of you are going to answer this way. Well, I'm not sure I know how. Let me tell you about this man called Jesus (laughs) that can calm the sea, that can call out the demons. If he can do all that, if you'll stop at Joe Blow's house, let me tell you, Jesus will tell you what to say. If you just go to his house and tell them what happened in your life. And let me share this with you. If you don't have a change in your life, today's the day. You can change it. See, we have this thing called an invitation. In just a minute, they're going to come sing. You can sing if you want to after we have a word of prayer. And the altar is going to be open. I'll be down here, Pastor Charles will be here, Pastor Andy will be here, and we can talk to you if you want us to talk to you, but really what you need to do is get alone with the Lord. And once you've done that, then if you need to share anything with us that you want to come and unite with our church, we'd be glad to have you. I would love to send Pastor Anthony a text this afternoon and say 17 people joined today. Can you stay another week? Please hear me very carefully. I would not say that. I would say, be glad to say that 17 people joined, but I would not ask him to stay another week. But I'd love to say that. I'd love to say that the altar was filled. I'd love to say that people responded, but I don't know what you'll do. I'll tell you what I am going to tell him this afternoon. Whatever the Lord instructs me to say. I will do that. Can you say that? Let me ask you this. Will you say that? Father, we come to you right now. I ask you to cleanse and forgive us. Lord, I pray that we would be obedient to just you, not anybody else. Lord, I pray that we would be obedient to you, not what I have said. Lord, if I said it without your... without your knowledge, without your authority, Lord, I pray they didn't hear it. I pray they only heard what you wanted them to hear. And Lord, right now I pray that we would respond in the way that only you want us to do. Not what I want, not what Pastor Anthony or Pastor Charles or Pastor Andy wants, but just what you want. Let's be obedient to you. Let's run to you today. Even from afar off, let us come to you. And then Lord, let us go where we need to go where you're instructing us to go and do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand and sing.
joining us online today. We hope you enjoyed the worship experience. If you want to get connected to our church family, the easiest way to do that is to text the word welcome to the number on the screen. That will put you into our text messaging service, which you will be able to get information about our church family and ways you can connect. If at any point during the message today, you felt a stirring or a prompting that you had questions and want to know more information, you can also, after you are a part of our text messaging service, you can just text that number and ask anything and it will come to our pastors. We can pray with you if you have a prayer request or whatever you may need. We invite you to come and join us in person. We would love to meet you face to face and see how we can serve your family within this community.